All right, welcome to the show. Today we have a very exciting show for you. We have the honor and privilege of speaking with Mike Williams. Uh, Mike Williams is a name that's probably very familiar to you. Uh, if you've ever listened to any of Les Brown's presentations, he's mentioned Mike Williams in any, every presentation that he's done. Uh, because Mike Williams, for a number of years, assisted Les Brown, and he's helped countless other people uh, reach levels of success. So today we're talking with Mike Williams about his second book, The Road to Your Best Stuff 2.0. If you have not gotten the first book, you owe it to yourself to get on Audible, download the copy of that. Mike reads it himself. Uh, so really, as you hear him read it, it's like an all up in your face, making sure you understand what needs to be done to get you to your best stuff. I told him before we got on here, I'm listening to it for the second time because I really do need that sometime. I really need that uh, voice in my ear to tell me, hey, man, you know what? You're not really digging and doing your best. You're actually just you know sur on the surface right now. So you really need to dig in deeper and give it your best shot. So Mike Williams, welcome to the show. Honored to have you here. Great to be here, Chris. Absolutely, man. So, I mean, before we get into all of what you did with Les, I want to talk about you because, I mean, over five decades, man, you've been in media and marketing and professional development and just helping people, uh, I guess, long before you ever got to Les. So let's talk about, you know, how you got started in this field to begin with. Actually, the field, as, as we think of it now, kind of a combination of personal and professional development, I kind of backed into. I was uh, in college in the late 60s. I was an activist who got a really good part-time job. And the part-time mm -hmm. job was uh, preparing people for the workforce who were, at that time, the phrase was what they call hardcore unemployed. Mm. So I was part of a, a program and I was a trainer and then a training coordinator in that job readiness process. So what I began doing at that time, and my focus was, we had different course levels or course types, but my focus was uh, African-American history and culture, just because of my orientation to reading and being familiar with that as an activist and then as a trainer that, that started to play into it. But what we started recognizing even back then was the, the, the role that identity plays in, in terms of some people, I mean, not identity plays, and in some people it's, it's far more intense than others, but the role of knowing who you are yeah. in the process of figuring out what your journey is going to be. So that began back then without, I had, without my having any knowledge of where it was going to go. And, my, and that was probably, that was like 1968. I, I met Les and began to work with him in, in the early 70s, 71, I think it was. So yeah that I was starting to build an interest and some history in sort of confronting that reality of how do you, you know, create paradigm shifts for people and that kind of thing. So that started uh, earlier. Wow. And so that, that's what led to the work that Les and I were doing. I met Les, ironically enough, I was a speaker at an event and Les was in the audience and he came to that, um, uh, came up to, to me after the event and just asked me about my interest in radio. And I had been, I was not particularly, I was not pursuing it and was not, I would say, really interested in it as much mm -hmm. as intrigued by it. And when he talked about it a little bit, I really did get interested in it in more than just intrigued. And it turned out to be a, a, such a great collaboration that less, that less got me into uh, uh, the doors that I need to get into to talk to people who had me do a live demo on the air, a newscast. I'm thinking, come on, what is this guy? This is a crazy thing, man. On a Saturday afternoon, I call Les after having left several messages and not getting a return. I catch him on the air live and, he's, and he says, what are you doing? I didn't know that was you. So what are you doing? I said, mm, nothing really. He said, well, come out to the station. Now he said, "Yeah, come on now. I'm I'm on for the next you know few hours, and we can catch up and talk and tell you what I'm thinking." Well, I get out to the station, and in the course of of our conversation, he says, "Well, let me ask you this: Can you read?" I said, "Well, yes, thank you. I, I've been reading uh, most of my yeah. life now. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can read." He said, and he left the room, left the studio, went into the um, the the room where they had news machines, mm -hmm. UPI and, and AP, 
And he came back with the torn off five minute summary, which was the common thing back in those days. You did a five minute news summary. And I was, you know, I had no idea what he was doing. He came back in and said, read this. And I said, um, okay. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, okay. I get it. You know, he said, mm -hmm. no, I want you to read it on the air. I said, what do you mean? He said, I want you, to, I asked you, could you read? And you said, yes. So we're coming up about five minutes from now. We're going to, I'm going to appoint to you and have you read this live on the air. I said, oh my goodness, this guy's wild. Yeah. I ended up doing the newscast. And two weeks later, I was you know, in the news department at, at that radio station. And that was in the spring of 71. And Les and I have been working together ever since. We talked about this just a few months ago. It was 50 years ago that he and I started working together. Wow, man. That's, I mean, that's an amazing story. I mean, because like I said, when you listen to you, man, you certainly have the chops. I mean, that's why, like I said, we're listening to the uh, audio book on Audible. I mean, it's an enjoyable listen because, I mean, you've got the chops for it. I mean, and the, and the way your, your storytelling ability and the way you just give direction, I mean, it makes it an easy listen. I want to go back to something you said about but you know, back in the day, I did not have a radio voice. A quote <laughs> radio voice. Wait a minute, you, are you telling you me you formed me your radio voice? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it sounds like you were born with it. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I want to go back to something you said a moment ago, because I think it's a very key. You talked about knowing yourself and knowing who you are and, and the mm -hmm. ability to be able to do that. And then you talked about you being an activist. I mm -hmm. think most of the time, uh, the only way that you can be an activist is because you come into that knowing who you are. And that's what it is. You're standing up for what you believe is mm -hmm. due to you. So mm -hmm. am I correct in, in, in thinking that? Oh, I think that you're absolutely correct. Uh, in fact, what you get in the time that I've observed since then, and I see these sort of fledgling people popping in and out, is that you can get thrown way off course by your passion if your passion doesn't connect to who you are. Mm. And sometimes you get, you know, you get just pick up something that annoys no, at you or gnaws at you, and you sort of run with that. And you don't have a foundation of, and I don't mean the foundation being educational and learning, mm -hmm. but if a foundation of, of, of who you are, and some people add into their who's you are, that's all part of who you are to me. Mm -hmm. But the dynamic of connecting to the ideas uh, can, begins with who you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I use in the second book, I, I talk about the example of, I was about to finish this book uh, the first one was written in 2008, um, published in 2008. Uh, the second one was just published this past year. But as, as toward the end of the of the process of writing this, uh, and I was going through edits at the time, um, the death of Chadwick Boseman popped, mm -hmm. you know, in, into my head so strongly that I said, "I got to do something about. I got to speak to that his." message about self-knowledge because it lines up with the stuff that Les and I and other people have been trying to convey in a broader way than, than just some sort of notion of, oh, isn't it nice to know who you are? No, it's mm -hmm. if you plan to do things and do big things or, or go somewhere profound with your life, mm -hmm. um, to, to not to come from someplace other than knowing who you are, put you at an extreme disadvantage and probably gonna, you're going to flame out. Yeah, yeah. Chadwick said on this on the uh, uh, TV show, HBO show, uh, The Shop, uh, they were asking him about roles because he had played uh, Jackie Robinson and um, Supreme Court Judge. I, I'm, okay, memory issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thurgood Marshall, uh huh? Thurgood Marshall, uh, James Brown. Mm -hmm. He played these people, and he talked about how do you how do you select roles? And he mm -hmm. said, first, who am I? Mm. I heard that and I said, oh, what, what, what'd you say? He said, I have to connect. I have to find myself in that when I see it on paper, if I don't see myself in there, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be dishonest with myself. I, if I don't see myself in there, I'm not going there. Mm. And he said, so it led to him not um, choosing certain kinds of roles or choosing to audition for certain kinds of roles. Mm. And the ironic part is he said, 
had I been on this one project that I passed up, I wouldn't have gotten this one that I ended up getting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Black Panther and all the other things that we associate with Chadwick uh, come out of his insistence that that you got to know who you are. Yeah. You know, and I think maybe that's the reason you connected with it so much and the reason I picked up on what you said, because you really convey that a lot in the road to your best stuff, the initial book. I mean, again, that importance of knowing who you are, what do you bring to a situation? And one of the things that I really appreciate is when you talk about the fact that if again, if it doesn't fit with you, being able to, uh, again, pass that up and then find somebody, if you're, if it's about building your team, find mm-hmm. somebody who's skilled, who that is, and mm-hmm. they can help accentuate what it is you're trying to do. Talk about as leaders, the importance of that and, uh, and why you felt the need to really make sure you cover that in the road to your best stuff, the initial book, and even in the second one. From the standpoint of leadership? Yes. One of the things that I've been dealing with, uh, this is kind of post book, but it's set up in the, in, in, and talked about in the first and second book. There are different kinds of leaders and there are different sort of, I, I call, I talk about de- developmental stages in all kinds of fields. And one of the fields that I talk about, even though we don't necessarily isolate it in the way that you think of a field, but I consider leadership to be a kind of a field, especially if it's outside the sector of how you make a living. Mm -hmm. But there are people who are starters, those who organize Mm -hmm. things going. There are people who are leaders who operate within a framework of what somebody else has started, or maybe they started, but the leadership role is is different than the role of starter Mm -hmm. or initiator. There are people who join, and that becomes a part of the framework that you need to, to do what you're doing. You've got to have people join, mm. and then you've got to have supporters. Not everybody will join. Some people will support you without joining, but there are all these tiers within that. But the people who relate to you, the people who relate to this thing that you're trying to do that's bigger than you, are people who come from a sense of who they are that matches up in a, in a mm. real way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from a leadership standpoint, that's why I was saying earlier, uh, no matter what your field, you can flame out if you don't come from that perspective of this is who I am and that's where this takes me. Mm-hmm. But being conscious of who you are is very important in terms of whether it's a, a leadership within the framework of a profession or field or a business or a venture of any kind of project, a nonprofit. Those kinds of people who don't go to that place of who am I in this? And and Les and I were just talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Part of this is who am I right now? Hmm. That is not just who I think of myself as being in general, but who am I at this stage? Like, and the the conversation we were having was about COVID. Hmm. Who are you in the midst of this sort of different stage of COVID? And what did you learn about yourself that you know required and requires some adjusting? Mm-hmm. And if you aren't self-aware, you won't even know that you're different. And we're different. Wow. Oh, COVID, COVID hit us. Yeah. <laughs> if you're living in any kind of way, you're different. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Well, Mike, let's let's do this. I mean, you talked about it. I mean, the first book was released 2008, second one 2021. I mean, after we've gotten in the middle of a pandemic, you talked talked about stages. What prompted you to say, you know what, I've got to get this second book out now. I mean, again, to make sure that folks can understand where I'm coming from now. Again, this is 2.0 to the road to your best stuff. Yep. Uh, I started writing. It took me three years to write the first one and three years to write the second one. I said to myself, mm-hmm. I'm t- I'm trying to do a redo. Why is it taking me so long? And I did not want to just, you know, sort of pick up and edit and do minor revisions. I wanted it to be a deeper, I wanted the book itself and I wanted my approach to it to be a deeper dive. So what I decided to do was let me just take this thing and piece it out and see what does it need? Uh, what does it have that, that, that has value? And what can I give to it to make it stronger. And, the, and where I think from, from 2018, uh, 2017 to 2020, I ended up digging, work my editor, you know, way more than she wanted to be working this because I kept redoing and coming back and re-going. 
did, are the stories making the point strongly enough or vividly enough? Am I introducing ideas through the work of people who either are recognized or who will be recognizable as a result of what they're doing? And is there a deeper dive in this? Mm-hmm. And the deeper dive got to be the primary motivation. So I started looking at, okay, if the last book allowed you to go into yourself, um, then this book will push you into yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that, the, the subtitle to, this, to the second one is pushing your career, business, or cause, not taking you, but pushing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I love it. the deeper dive, uh, uh, the people, my, my editor says it's better written in terms of um, literary value, I guess you call it, or something like that. But the fact that the stories the stories seem to fit uh, for circumstances that, that connect with more people, that was, those are all things that I thought I had a chance to do. And, if, and, I, and I started really thinking, Chris, what if this is the last thing I do as a book? Mm-hmm. I did not want dated information to be the last thing I had out there. And even though it gets dated you know, once it's out, period. I mean, this one will be dated at some point, but I didn't want the last one to be things that they didn't have. No, Obama's not in my first book Mm -hmm. because he was selected in 2008. There are lessons to be learned from his election, his process of getting elected, um, and things to be learned about other things and other people that I really felt like I needed to convey and bring in in the second book. And that's, that's how uh, the first one led to the second, but it took three years to do the, to the, re, the revision. So. Yeah. 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 And, it, and so based on hearing you describe that, it sounds though, as if really you do not, while you certainly can benefit from having read the first book uh, mm-hmm. and going into the second one, you don't necessarily have to go back to the first book in order no. to benefit from the second one. No, not at all. In fact, uh, one of the things I ran into is, people thinking, well, I don't want to write, start the second one until I've, I've gotten the first one. And I said, well, I get that uh, from somebody who doesn't know. I said, but, but people who have uh, picked up the second one did not miss anything. And they say that they, they've gotten both and they got both later. And they said, well, yeah, the first book is fine, but the second book is better. And I didn't need the first one to, to benefit from the second. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, Mike, and you talked about it earlier on, you know, when you talk about your college days and you talk about the training that you had and the training in order to become a trainer and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But I guess when I, when I listen to the book and I, and I, and I'm hearing you process, it's like, I I guess I've always been told one of the best things someone can give you is to help you to understand how they think. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, has your mind always been, and it's your, your perspective on things. For example, in, in book one, you talk about this barber and this, he's got a barber shop and he's working within the shop. And you talk about how he can expand that business, but not necessarily uh, being so involved in the day-to-day process. Mm-hmm. Has your mind always been uh, catered to business in that way? And if so, is it from your parents or upbringing in some way? It wasn't always related to business, but it was related. It has been, and I would say, I I don't know how far back I can go, but I used to use this example. I'm the guy who pulls coats. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I see something, I mean, I will will not front somebody. I will say, you know what? Uh, You might want to look at this because uh, you go over here and this is going to help you do something that you might not have even anticipated, but it, it can take you somewhere that I think you'd really like to be. So that characteristic uh, is something that I, that I think I, I'm not sure if I got it from one of my parents or the two of them, but I know that the orientation toward being analytical and scrutinizing the heck out of things, I don't, I, that's probably just my nature. That, that's probably that, that Virgo going into, you know, uh, overdrive. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, I, yeah, but let me, let me figure it out. I don't know. Let me figure this out. Let me dig a little deeper. So digging a little deeper, going a little further is, is kind of my mantra. Um, and I know that both of my parents were, uh, my mother's still living, my father passed. My mother's about to turn 101 here shortly. Wow. Uh, but, but being able to think apart from how other people were thinking, uh, was very, very big. It's, it's probably the, the, the singular thing that I can remember growing up uh, that my sister and I, my older sister and I especially, 
share is that we weren't we weren't encouraged to just follow the thinking um, and therefore getting into a point of view that represented the thought process that you used and to be able to defend that thought process uh, was important. And when I applied that to business, uh, it was the math guy in me, the frustrated math guy, putting analysis into situations where you say, okay, yeah, Keith, um, you might want to, you don't have to do multiple locations. You can maybe expand that, the, the, the course of what you're doing by doing what you can really do well in one location. Mm -hmm. uh, that was how kind of how that came out because I started looking at things that maybe other people didn't look at. I saw him develop and, you know, as a, uh, as a, a hairstyle barber and hairstylist, and I, you just know people got things, you know, they got yeah. stuff. Yeah. And you see, I, and I would always touch base with him about where he was and what he was doing, where he was going, probably more than he cared to, to, to say, because I, it requires some thinking. And, you know, barbers like to just talk. They don't like to, to stop and think sometimes. Yeah. And so we would have that dynamic going and I would, I would interrupt his flow and when he was presiding over the, the contemporary conversation in the barbershop by asking him something like, mm, what's next for you, man? Yeah. Dang, Mike, why are you gonna ask <laughs> why are you asking me that? I ain't thinking about that right now. I know, I know you're entertaining. Yeah, you yeah. doing the barber thing. Yeah, but I just, I ain't gonna see you for a while. So I just thought I'd ask, you know, what's next? Yeah. Well, it sounds like you certainly have a knack for doing that because, and you share it in the book, and we both share friends and, and less, uh, you know, because you talk about how less uh, there were many times where, again, you would have to have a similar conversation because I guess uh, many times less can kind of, you know, think on his feet pretty quick and, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of fly by the seat of his pants or what have you. But you, <laughs> you are that voice of reason that comes in and says, wait a minute. There's a better way to do this. <laughs> Interesting collaboration. I was thinking about this the other day because I neither Les nor I would ever see each other on paper and say, why would he, why would he be working with me? Why would I want to hear that from him, from his side and, and, my, and from my side? Why would I want to put up with all that? Yeah. Well, what happens is you start to do things, do work on projects and you see how somebody else's um, skill, talent, um, energy fits with this project that we're on in a different way than yours does. And you start to see things like, hmm, you know, that really was great. It turned out to be fantastic. And we both come back, you know, slapping each other five saying, you know, that really went, that went well. You know, yeah. that was, that was a really good thing. In over and, 50 years, you've done that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, not even now. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, when you talk about this next book, I mean, what are you, what do you feel or what, what do you want folks to take away from this, uh, the road to your best stuff 2.0? There are two things that I probably uh, don't mention enough as isolated things, but, but get sort of spread out and talked about more generally. But one of them is I'm always trying to get people to go from micro to macro. Yeah. And I'm a little bit impatient with people who don't even like to think macro. When I say a little bit impatient, I mean, you know, when I get an inquiry about working with somebody who's got a little bitty idea about what they want to do, and I'll say pretty typically, you know what, I think there are people who could do what you're doing, what you need a lot better than I can. And uh, I, I just don't see a match. Mm -hmm. uh, and mostly that match is out of what I would call temperament or um, openness to um, critique and analysis and questions. If you're not open to that, and if they don't see it big enough, I'm probably not going to. I'm 78 years old. I'm not going to mess around with things that are tiny just mm -hmm. because it's the convenient next step for somebody. So, Yeah, yeah. And, and you may have very well just said it, you know, to those aspiring entrepreneurs and those who are looking to get into business and may not fully understand uh, when you talk about micro macro that we are in a global society today. I mean, you and I, two different locations, but we're coming together in a conversation that will be shared worldwide. Yep. Uh, you know, how do we get our young people to begin to see 
the magnitude of what they have available to them today? I think young people, there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to being uh, uh, an aspiring youth. And maybe the biggest disadvantage is, is thinking that you can just scope from a little tiny idea to something big, like uh, they're dribbling really well, so they think they want to be an NBA, an NBA star. Or, and I don't, I'm not one of those who's saying that, no, I'm not saying that that's not appropriate for you to pursue, but are you looking at, be, be willing to look at what the things are that stand in the way. And I don't, when I in the way, I don't necessarily mean things that prevent you, but things that you have to go through, the gates that you have to, you know, to, to enter into and, and complete is that if you think, if you get a sense that, that that level of work, when you hear people talk about things like something as simple as basketball, and they talk about how many times you shoot, mm -hmm. somebody, somebody uses the term 10,000. Mm -hmm. You do something 10,000 times. Mm -hmm. There's something about the infinitesimally small things that once that if you get committed to will take you to larger mm -hmm. and larger things and if that's not in your spirit to go there, then let's not even talk about, you know, ultimate levels. If you can't talk about the interim and intermediate, you know, requirements, if you want to be a, a physician, you know, lock in on biology. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying that, that because you weren't good in science, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm saying lock in on the medicals, on, on biological sciences and see where it can take you, see whether or not there are pieces in here that speak to you. And if they do, move with it. And if they don't, choose something different. Mm. Um, I like it. They, but, they, but it comes back to who are you? Mm -hmm. Are you that person who is willing to dig in where the digging in is needed? Or are you one of those who's pretty much likes to talk about it and make it sound good? Um, you know, I, I, it's very clear to me, you know, that that how, what you're made of will have a lot to do with, you know, what's what happens at the end of all this. What's what you get made. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So Mike, in addition to being an author and publisher, I mean, you work with uh, as coaching in terms of uh, C-level suite exec executive coaches, things of that nature. What are some of the additional things that you do? I actually do not, I'm not working with uh, corporate types at this stage. Okay. Okay. What I'm doing and mostly is freelancers and independent um, freelancers, I guess is the best term to talk about. Okay. But the biggest thing I'm doing is program design. Mm -hmm. Is that for and it's and it's it's kind of orienting itself toward nonprofits, but it's also like one of the things. It's it's the most prominent thing I've done with Les in the last 10, 15 years. He mm -hmm. and I, from time to time, will do training things together. But uh, but I'm designing uh, training and uh, associated programs, developmental programs for him and and a lot of the stuff he's doing, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, in other situations as well, designing programs that take people through the stages from concept to achievement and and those various pieces that they have to gather, uh, those doors that they have to go through and getting them an understanding and a willingness to, uh, to look at that mm -hmm. uh, just with as much passion as they look at, you know, the dream on the other end. Okay. I use the example of, uh, uh, I think it's probably, uh, maybe in both books, which is, a, is an attorney that I met who, who's, um, who really was enamored with uh, Thurgood Marshall. And when the time she was 10, 11 years old, she, she, anybody asked her what she was going to be when she grew up, she said a lawyer, maybe a judge, but definitely a lawyer. And um, her example was uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall. I met her in the early 2000s, late, late 90s, early 2000s, and that was probably seven or eight years out of law school. She went to, she went honors, uh, undergrad, uh, graduated high in her class in, in uh, law school, uh, and began to practice, but she couldn't find her place in the practice of law. She, she didn't 
see herself as a prosecutor. Uh, she didn't. See, it, it's like the things. If you watch, if you're picking up your your, your assigned role from the movies or some idyllic place. If you don't know what the workaday life is like, then you may not find out until you get into it. Yeah. And and their and lawyers are the most common, the people that I run into the most who are saying, this really wasn't me, that mm. my idealism, I did not find a place for my idealism in there. And maybe my idealism was off, but for whatever reason, that's not a field that I can find myself in. And so many of them are teaching law or teaching other subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, many of them. Wow. She was looking for she was looking for a way to use speaking and her passion about ideas um, in a different way outside of uh, the law, the practice of law. Mm -hmm. Okay, you talked about doing program design. Uh, any specifics in terms of the types of programs that you assist individuals with? For those who may be listening. Well, the, for, for individuals, I'm doing public programs like the kinds of things that, that Les does. I'm going to be doing my own. Um, I'd like to do a, uh, a workshop on the book. Okay. And uh, probably a combination of virtual and in-person. I'm such an in-person. My history of training is so visceral that I find it very hard uh, to relate to uh, training in the same way when I'm not face to face mm -hmm. seeing and feeling that energy. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that prospect. But one of the things that I've done with Les is to create public programs that he's doing like for speakers. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll put together curriculum stuff, uh, focus points of information and interaction. Uh, 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 when we were doing more of it, I would do like a design a three or four day training program. So training programs are the most common things that I've done with him and for myself. But the things that I want to do, uh, and I'm starting to do more of, are things which are sort of um, um, social programs, that is mm -hmm. trying to solve a specific kind of problem. Okay. I can't get into it now. But there are there are some things that I'm working on that are designed to get to uh, using a, a, a combination of awareness and public consciousness mm -hmm. and into the, the rudiments of digging in and working through some root causes of problems that we're not willing or not we haven't bought into as a way of really solving larger problems. We sort of do the political expedient thing very often when uh, what's required in my judgment are way more substantive than that and longer term than that. So yeah. that's kind of where I'm going. All right. In addition well, to my own pieces as um, a training resource. Well, I certainly look forward to seeing anything else you do. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that we make sure folks aware of it. Uh, and just before we move on to the next question, what give us your website. MikeWilliamsSolutions.com. All right. All right. There you have it, Mike. Little less on the end. All right. Good deal. So, Mike, and as we prepare to land this plane, I guess you again, we've talked about over five decades of uh, experience and, and just knowledge that you bring to all of what you do. Uh, what do you think is a tribute? What do you attribute your success to? You know, it's I probably rarely think of that term. Um, what what I'm most what I think I've done better and achieved most in is that compulsive analytic in me that I find people who uh, <laughs> who have a taste for that? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh -huh. Who have a sense that this guy's going to chew on this forever, and you may as well just you know bring him on in, let him help chew on it for you, help you do the that. There's this this uh, the philosophy student that I was way back when has turned into this. A uh, problem solver of a certain kind, and when I get a chance to do that, it harkens me back to the things I started with, which means that that being a seeker uh, and wanting to share what you find when you seek, mm -hmm. uh, and that urge uh, is virtually insatiable. It's like. Um, I'm 78. Yeah. I have, when the people use the word retirement to me, I say, 
that means tired all over again. I didn't know about being retired. I don't know what you mean. I'm 78 going on or whatever the next thing is and the next project is. And I don't want to talk about anything other than what that next work is, where that next place to go, to be, to do. Um, yeah. Like I said, my mom's about to turn 101 and I'm yeah. riding that uh, uh, that wave. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Well, I guess let me just scratch that next question off my list. <laughs> I was going to ask you, you know, not that we foresee it anytime soon, but how would you like to be remembered? But uh, so let's scratch that off. <laughs> guy working on stuff. Uh, what do you mean, remembered? <laughs> you gone? <laughs> you see, man, I'm in my stride getting things done. <laughs> Tom, tell the truth. Shame the devil. <laughs> so, you, so I guess the question then becomes, what's next? You've got 2.0 out now. I mean, what? So, what's next? If I can get the um, materials and the, use the platforms that uh, my young uh, uh, compadres are so facile with, that I am so awkward with. If I can get uh, aligned for taking that kind of thing, the material from this, there's a methodology in this that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to, to, to put out there. And this, so the processes that are aligned in the book, I talk about uh, professional, pro personal, organizational, and promotional dimensions that we all have. Well, mm -hmm. if I can work with people in getting through those things, getting into those things, asking the questions that probe them along the path in a broader way, mm -hmm. a more universal or slash global way, then I could see that going uh, uh, to taking it to another uh, level of content or a different kind of content. Um, one of the things that I considered uh, uh, is, or two, two projects, one of them is, a workbook, this is a working book, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about a workbook that, that becomes uh, more appropriate for people who are literally working from a, a workbook uh, kind of format. Mm -hmm. And the other one is kind of uh, uh, motivational writing, uh, inspirational writing is that, that uh, a lot of what's in me is the term that I use with my grandkids and, and, and the people that I communicate with in that way is encouraging words. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a speaker in the sense that I expect to be uh, doing what the Les Browns and people like that do, but I believe that my domain is kind of the written word with some pointed uses of audio like <laughs> long as people like you were saying it sounded all right to them, mm -hmm. I ain't got to worry about my pork job voice anymore. Uh, <laughs> then, then that those are the things that I consider to be the the developing um, terrain for me. Well, Mike Williams, Mike Williams, I can tell you, I certainly look forward to all of it. And again, it's been a great pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I've listened to the audio book again on my second listen now uh, to the road to your best stuff. And then now to know that you have the road to your best stuff 2.0, uh, certainly look forward to reading it and listening to it as well. So fantastic. Absolutely. So again, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you caught this conversation anywhere in the middle, I encourage you to go back and listen to it from the beginning. And for more information regarding Mike Williams, go again, go to MikeWilliamsSolutions.com and stay in tune uh, with all that he's got coming up. Uh, you certainly will benefit from it. Again, uh, I benefited greatly just from listening to the first book. So I encourage you to do the same. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris.